Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. So uh, today we are going to talk about lecture 13, Transformers and LLM, the second part of Transformers and Large Language Models. So in today's lecture, we are going to see several techniques to compress large language models by using quantization and also sparsity and also those advanced inference systems techniques such as uh, um, VLLM um, and also the page to attention. So this is going to be the today's agenda, starting with efficient inference algorithms. Uh, we are going to review several techniques like quantization, pruning, and also systems, VLM, streaming LM, uh, flash attention, speculative de decoding, and finally efficient fine tuning techniques. How do we customize the large language models by using LoRa adapter prompt tuning techniques? Okay, so let's start with uh, quantization. So we'll introduce actually three techniques, including smooth quant for 8-bit uh, quantization and AWQ for 4-bit quantization. And finally, tiny chat that implements those 4-bit quantized model on hardware. And these techniques has been integrated by the uh, NVIDIA Tensor RT LLM, which was just open source the last week. So this is a pretty timely lecture. Welcome to try the TRT LLM. Let's review what is quantization we've covered in lecture five and also, and also lecture six. Basically we map uh, the range or the 14 point range into integer values. Okay, so we have the Q min and Q max. We have a zero point mapping the zero point to the floating, floating number zero. Uh, so this is an example of two bit quantization where we have four centroid where each centroid is representing like from minus two, minus one, zero and one. So can we directly apply the quantization techniques we've learned in lecture uh, in the previous lecture to large language model? Actually, we tried it, but it failed, right? When the, large, the model gets larger, uh, more than uh, 6 billion parameters, the performance degradation is actually, actually pretty severe. You see a pretty big accuracy degradation when the model gets larger. So um, we find actually this is due to large language model has outliers in the activations, making the large language model difficult to quantize. So let's see, what is the, um, uh, what is the outliers? So this is showing uh, the outliers in the activation. So this is showing the weight. What is the difference here? So laws of outliers, like this channel, this channel, this channel, these three channels has values that is much larger than the remaining. Uh, than the remaining channels. But the weight is pretty flat. The range is pretty small between zero and one. But here the value of the activation is between zero and 70, even larger than 70. So such large dynamic range makes activation difficult to quantize. But the weight are really is so easy to quantize. So how do we deal with it? A natural thinking, a very smart way to think about it is actually can we um, multiply this channel by a, like 0 0.1 and enlarge the weight by 10 times? Even enlarging it by 10 times is still pretty small. And the key principle is that matrix multiplication is linear, right? X times W, we can multiply X by 0 0.1 and we can multiply W by 10. So the final result is still the same. So in this way, we can flatten smooth those activations to make it feel more flat where we no longer have those big values okay and here is this uh the weight the weight is harder to quantize due to it's slightly more bumpy than this case but it's still compared with here it's still relatively easy to quantize so here we effectively migrated the quantization difficulty from the activation to the weight making them um, easy to quantize. So how do we do that in practice? So this is showing an example where we have activation, we have the weight. Initially, you have two outlier channels. So here we have pretty big channel, minus 16, 8. And here you have a pretty big channel, 6 and 9. The weight is relatively flat. And we calculate a, uh, a scaling factor. Okay, scaling factor uh, 1, 4, 1, 3, which is uh, obtained by um, 
dividing the, the, the number having the square root of the max of the x and also the max of the w. Okay? So the max of x, for example, here, the max is 16. The max of the w here is one. So divide, it, divide that, and then you have the square root of that, you get four in this position. Okay? In that way, we can convert the matrix multiplication in another way. They are mathematically equal, like 16 multiplied by one equal to four uh, times four. Okay? And similar here, um, eight times one equal to uh, two times four. So they are still mathematically equal, but here we no longer have these huge outlier channels in the smooth quantization activation, right? So it's effectively smoothed the, quant uh, the activation. And what is the, uh, there's no free lunch, right? You smooth the activation. What is the uh, overhead here? Which one gets harder to quantize? The weight, right? Previously, the weight is just super easy to quantize, one, two, right? But now uh, it gets slightly harder, but still within our control, slightly harder, but still okay to be quantized. So by using this way, everything is still mathematically equal. And how do we deal with this scaling factor? Do we have to introduce some actual computation to do such um, matrix multiplication? Like we are multiplying um, s to the power of minus one to x, and we are mu multiplying s to w. Since this one, these two, they cancel each other, they are identity matrix. Do we need to add extra computing to here? For weight, it's easy. You can fold the scaling factor to the weight offline, right? And for the activation, this is a hyperparameter, it's a constant number, no matter what input it is. So we can fold this into the layer norm of the previous layer. Right? Last lecture, we introduced the layer norm, uh, which is having a bias, having a scaling factor. So here we are exploiting that, that scaling factor uh, to uh, multiply the certain channels. So that can be folded into the previous uh, normalization layer. So at the runtime, there is no actual overhead at all. So mathematically equal, no runtime overhead. Everything can be computed during compile time. So here we, uh, we can quantize both the weight and activations for all those compute intensive kernels, including the QKV transformation, uh, DMM in the attention, uh, QK transpose times, um, at times V, finally the output projection layer and two FFN layers. Okay? Only these layer norm soft max layers is capped in IP16. So now we can match the accuracy. Previously we lose the accuracy when the model is larger than 6.7 billion. Now the accuracy recovered. And let's see what about the latency and also the memory. So previously, this is the uh, previous memory. Now the memory is reduced by half. Okay? So in order to serve, uh, this is the OPT 175 billion parameter model used to require, um, this is eight A100 GPU to serve that. Now we, we need only four, okay? Reduce the number of GPUs by half. Uh, each GPU is pretty expensive. It's like 20K each. And now you immediately, sa immediately saved 80K dollars. What about the latency? Like in this, in this case, it's even faster, lower latency, since we don't need to communicate. Uh, everything is quantized to int eight rather than FP16. And there's no com less communication, um, so, the latency is even faster. What about even larger model, like um, uh, NLG, uh, MTL, uh, Microtron Turing NLG 530 billion parameter model? So the accuracy is pretty well maintained. And here we can reduce the number of serving GPUs from 16 to eight. So each node is super expensive, it's like 200K for, uh, for uh, 200 and 300K for H100 and 180K for A100. So each node is pretty expensive. We can reduce it by, by half and also keep the latency the same. What about newer models like LAMA? In the last lecture, we introduced 
uh, the open source model Llama, Llama One, Llama Two. So what's the new? Uh, what's new here? It introduced the Swish, uh, Swish GLU, right? Use the Swish activation function, turning those full, two fully connected layer into three layers, gated linear unit, referred to last lecture, and also introduced this rotary relative positional encoding. If you remember that from the last lecture, will these advanced changes impact the quantization? Actually, uh, smooth quant still works very well for this case. The quantized llama families, llama one, llama two, make a large llama into a smaller llama. Um, this is llama 7b, 13b, 30b, all the way to 65b. Um, this is the perplexity. It's well, very well maintained on the wiki text data set. So smooth quant makes the weight and activation into 8 bit, right? By smoothing the activations, pushing the quantization difficulty from the activation to the weight, um, improving, the, uh, throughput, improving the throughput for large language model. What about the batch size is small, okay? In the edge scenario or real time interaction, like you wanna to talk to a robot, one-to-one um, -one conversation. When the batch size is small, we observe, uh, this is the uh, roof line model. Okay, the x-axis is the compute intensity. The y-axis is the measured uh, t-ops per second. When the batch size is one, there is actually a pretty low utilization. This is your peak, peak um, t-ops per second. This is the measured t-ops per second. It's very well underutilized. It's highly because it's highly memory bounded, right? Uh, because the large language model are pretty big. Like Llama 2 7B has 7 billion parameters. If you're using FP16, how many storage do you need? That's 14 gigabytes, right? 14 gigabytes, that's pretty big. You have to fetch 14 gigabytes in an auto regressive manner, which means generating each token requires 14 gigabytes of memory access. Remember, computation is cheap, memory is expensive. We have to, we want to reduce those memory footprint. And compared with the activate uh, the weight, the activation is actually small, right? So the weight is like 4K by 4K, um, but the activation, if it's single batch, is like one by 4K. It's a thousand times smaller. Therefore, we should focus on compressing the weight. So that's why we introduce uh, this low bit weight only quantization. We're also going to see that in the homework. So that's why we need such uh, weight only quantization to reduce the memory bandwidth. Uh, previously, we have to fetch uh, 14 gigabytes of memory. What about if we quantize the weight to four bit for Llama 7B? What is the memory footprint now? Three and a half, right? Three and a half gigabyte, four times smaller. So this is naively doing that from, uh, this is a weight matrix. So you know, using that P16 representation, the four eight by four matrix, this is the quantized version. It's again eight by four, but it's quantized uh, using um, three bit in this case for easy uh, to, to show it. But immediately we see this perplexity degradation. The lower the perplexity, the better the quality. But here, unfortunately, there's a huge jump um, of the perplexity if we naively quantize it. Perplexity is a measurement of the quality of a language model. It's showing the, uh, the accuracy of predicting the next word, whether you are accurately predicting the next word or not. So the lower, the better. So unfortunately, you're actually doing run to nearest quantization using three bit hurt the accuracy a lot. Uh, even if you're using this uh, group wise quantization, so here every, um, 128 numbers are quantized together and we have a shared scaling factor, a finer granularity of shared uh, scaling factor, every uh, 128 elements, which we covered in the section lecture of the uh, quantization part. Interestingly, we find not all the weights are equally important. 
just by quantizing 1%, um, keep 1% of the roles in FP16, it help a lot immediately bring back the perplexity for the original value. This is so amazing. We seem to find a way to quantize that, right? Only keep 1% into FP16. Um, like here, only one channel, keep it as uh, the same as before. Just don't quantize it. And immediately bring back uh, the perplexity, the quality, okay? So therefore we have two natural uh, to-dos. One to-do is to think about how do we choose those um, sitting channels? Which channel is important? There exists, so the channel is only 1% of the channel, but how do we systematically select those 1% of the channels? And second to-do is keeping IP16 will make the inference kernel difficult. How do we get rid of this mixed precision? and still use full quantization. Everything will be in blue rather than having 1% in, in yellow. So let's answer those two, two questions. When we are doing pruning, how do we select these important weights? Which one to prune, which one to remove? We do look at the, the weight itself, right? If it is large, we think, oh, that's an important weight, important channel, we should keep it. What if we do it here? We look at the weight. If it is large, we just remove, oh, keep it, otherwise we remove it. Unfortunately, perplexity is pretty high. And we did another way. Don't look at the weight. Since weight is multiplied with the activation, let's look at those activations. Since during smooth quantum, we find some activation are pretty huge. We wanna preserve those outlier channels. So say this is the outlier channel. This is a pretty big activation channel. And that is consistent for different inputs, different tokens. They're all big channels. And then if this channel is big in the activation, this corresponding weight is considered salient or important. And we should keep them. So using this way, by looking at the activation, not the weight, that's why we call it activation aware weight only quantization. You are quantizing the weight, but you look at the activation to, to determine which weight is salient. By looking at the activations uh, magnitude, it's easier um, to recover the perplexity. So we solve the first to do, okay? Look at the activation, not the weight, to determine those 1% saving channel. Then we have the second to do, right? Um, can we re, uh, don't, not rely on this mixed precision, still use all FP, sorry, all int four or all int three to get rid of this mixed precision. We tried a very simple technique. We just multiply uh, this weight channel by two and divide the activation channel by two. So they are mathematically equal like smooth part. Um, so by multiplying it, from like 1.5, 2, and 4, we find um, this is a very effective way to recover the perplexity without introducing um, this FP16, 1% of channels in FP16, just multiply that salient channel by a number larger than one and bring back um, this perplexity. This is so amazing. Previously, we have to rely on rely on 1% of the channels being, quant uh, being unquantized in FP16, making the kernel difficult to write. But now just multiply the sitting channel by a larger number and it will recover. Another, but another problem came, how, we, how large should we multiply that channel? Like here you first see um, the perplexity decrease and the increase. So there must be a sweet spot where we want to automatically search um, uh, the multiplier. So let's see, analyze first, why enlarging the channel make it easier to recover the perplexity? So this layer is not denoted by weight times the activation. And then we care about the quantization error from the quantized version of the W times X, okay? 
Um, so QW, quantized version of W, basically equal to, uh, we, uh, this is defining the, the range. Okay, we divide the range by the number of centroids. Since you have n bits, they are to the power of n minus one um, centroids. And this is the distance between each centroid. And then we um, give W divided by this number and multiply this number to the in the outside. And we have to round it uh, to the nearest integer. So that's the quantized version of W. If we, what if we scale that? Like here, we scale it by like 1.5, by two, for those salient to weight, what happened to that? So we scale up the weight and we have to scale down the activation. Okay? So previously it's Q, um, um, QW times X, now it's QW times S, uh, times X divided by S. So they are still mathematically equal, S gets canceled here. If we plug in, WS into the uh, representation for the Q, uh, we can see SW is here. Since W becomes SW and X divided by S is here. What happened here is that the rounding function always has a, a expect, expectation of 0 0.25. Since rounding is always, the rounding error ranges from zero to 0 0.5, right? Like 1.5 get rounded to two, 1.75 get rounded to two as well. The average is zero and two, two five. It's a quarter since it's between zero and 0 0.5. So this doesn't change. Um, what about this delta? Okay, so this delta is only dependent, is only dependent on the maximum of the weight. So there are a group of weights in the vertical dimension. Um, and the group size is 128, uh, just scale up one channel, it's very unlikely to change the max value unless one in 125, 128, you hit that max value. Otherwise you're not going to change it. So this, w, uh, this delta is not going to change, but only this S is something, S is larger than one, so this error is scaled down, okay? So when the S is greater than one, Array is scaled down. That's why scaling up, scaling up the sitting channel can achieve the same effect of making that channel to be FP16. Before the quantization. So it's easier to quantize. Okay, so we scaled it up, and then the equation is very similar to smooth quant, make it easy. Uh, to in, uh, for industry to put into products, right? Same infrastructure, you can do either smooth quant or AWQ. So here we times uh, W times S, X divided by S. This can be fused to the previous operation or fused into the layer norm. And then we take a data-driven approach to do a, a fast grade search to search the uh, best scaling factor, which is greater than one. And later follow-up work, even propose a learning-based method to use gradient descent to learn the best scaling factor. So this is three bit, uh, group size 128, a llama, uh, and also llama two. Uh, AWQ shows consistent better performance compared with round to nearest or GPTQ or GPTQR, um, like seven B all the way to 30 B models. It also work, out, work well for multi-model large language model, which we are going to introduce in the next lecture on region transformers. So this is Flamingo for image captioning. Um, this is comparison with different baselines, actually pretty significant improvement about the uh, accuracy here. Given this image, the round to nearest baseline quantization model says a model airplanes flying in the sky. AWQ can say two toy airplanes sitting on the grass field. And this one baseline model is saying a man is holding a baby elephant in his arm versus AWQ says a man, his daughter pose with an elephant. Uh, the last one, a man and a dog walking past some bushes versus AWQ, two dogs are walking on the street. 
can even uh, use lava, quantize lava to do visual reasoning. Right? Given this, uh, there is some caption here, but it's all represented in the image format, although it has some text. You have to automatically to do OCR to understand it. Some chicken like a world map. Uh, the baseline quantization RTN model says there are small pictures of the Earth and other planets placed on top of the food, versus AWQ says a lighthearted and humorous take on the concept of looking at the pieces of the Earth from space. A plate of fried food, especially chicken nuggets, is presented with the caption, and the caption is actually exactly the same as the caption here. So it means uh, this vision language model is automatically doing the OCR to understand uh, the text here. Uh, one more example, it's able to recognize this, who is painting, who painted this, Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, so uh, smooth quantum AWQ are widely used these days. That's why we also put it in the homework uh, in the lab four, which we released last week. Uh, we'll give you the code and also it will pave the way for lab five, which we are going to actually implement that on the laptop. Um, Amelia Faster Transformer and Tensor RTLM. This is the library run uh, large language model inference, which is actually a pretty amazing library released actually last week. How amazing, how timely we are. Um, the Tensor RTLM, the intro, uh, the, uh, they are using the smooth quant um, and AWQ as their quantization approaches. And also, Intel. We'll chain Berkeley's VLM, we're just going to talk about that. Berkeley fast chat, uh, hugging face, and since time, and some, several open source community have been using that. Okay, so how do we translate this uh, theoretical saving into a measure of the speed up? And can we deploy this large language model on edge devices like on our laptops, on our phones? Okay, so I'm going to introduce Tiny Chat, which is a lightweight chatbot for large language model on the edge. This is what we designed, 3D printed computer, which has a JSON Ori Nano inside. Um, and we also have a demo here on the right. So deploying large language model on the edge is quite useful. For example, you run Copilot locally on your edge device, code completion office, game chat, especially coding, um, some enterprise data is privacy sensitive. You don't want to upload to the cloud. Um, but these devices are very resource constrained. Like here, it's only a small, uh, less than Ori Nano, resource constrained, low power, and also do not have access to the internet always. The privacy is important, okay? So here is our tiny tech computer. You can ask it questions. Uh, and so scroll up to see the previous answers. So basically, Tiny Chat uh, implements this four bit compressed AWQ model. Okay, the weight is four bit to save the memory footprint. And here we are doing um, running it on different laptops. This is running the Code Llama, writing code using Code Llama really fast. And this is um, comparing MIT Harvard. You can use to give it different prompts. Blazing fast. After lab four, you are going to implement something similar on your laptop, uh, on lab five. And feel free to continue improving that and pushing to the code base of Tiny Chat Engine as final project, which is open ended. But this could be one of the choices. And the key technique to enable such fast inference is algorithm and system co design. Right. So on the algorithm side, four-bit AWQ quantization. On the system side, is a tiny engine technique and parallel computing techniques. We introduced uh, loop enrolling, blocking, uh, cache locality, right? Um, and also multi-threading, uh, CUDA programming, uh, different techniques. And also how do we um, lay out the four-bit weight in memory and runtime decoded from four-bit to 16-bit to avoid this decoding overhead. Um, that is also one of the key technique to make it run fast. So this is comparing 
on the 1490 GPU without and with AWQ, how, uh, how far, how much speed up we can get, right? So that P16 version is showing both the weight and activation in yeah, P16. So that's 50 tokens per second running on 1490 GPU. Um, this is the AWQ version, okay? The weight is only four bit, activation is still 16 bit. Um, since this is the memory bottleneck, not the activation. So we keep activation at P16 uh, to preserve the accuracy. And we run time decode the weight from in, a, in, in four by P16 and do the arithmetic in P16 since computing is cheap. The memory footprint is expensive. This is exactly the way uh, we did in the efficient inference engine in ISCA uh, 16. Now this method reborn and proved to be quite helpful uh, to accelerate this large language model uh, for real time inference. This one already finished. This one is still slowly making progress. And Tiny Chat is also flexible, support a lot of different large language models like MPT7B and Mosaic, Falcon 7B, and also the Kuna 7B. It can also run the uh, 13B parameter model on a MacBook, and even on a JSON Orin, which is a, a mobile GPU, mobile GPU, 30 tokens per second running uh, Lama 2. This is show, uh, telling some attractions in the Boston area, Freedom Trail, Museum of Fine Art, New England, Aquarium, Fermi Park, all places I love. All right, so um, now let's switch gear from quantization to Freudian sparsity, okay? Um, how do we exploit Freudian sparsity in neural net in large language models? So this work, uh, Wanda tell us we should consider um, the weights and also the activations. So previously, magnitude is what we introduced in weight pruning. And look at the magnitude, if it is large, then keep it. If it is small, then set it to zero. So this is the after pruning, prune the weights. But Wanda is telling us we should, very similar to AWQ, we should not only look at the weight, but also the activation is going to multiply with. Since large language model tend to have super big, Values, these outlier values in the activation. So we should protect the weights corresponding to those large activations, very similar observation as AWQ. In this way, the pruning criteria becomes weight times the activation. If it is large, then we keep it. Otherwise, we uh, throw it away, set it to zero. So the resulting pruned weights, the mask is actually different from the original one. And it turned out to be. Uh, quite helpful um, compared with the magnitude based pruning, which is the first rule. So, take home is use weight times activation absolute value as a criteria rather than just look at the weight itself. There's also opportunity for activation sparsity, okay? not only the weight sparsity, but also the activation sparsity. So, this work from our group in HPCA 2021. Spatten uh, introduced this token pruning and had a pruning. Since the attention mechanism, if you recall, has no weight, QK transpose, softmax times V, that's it. They're all activations, there are no weights. So we have to prune uh, the tokens. And luckily, there's plenty of room to prune the tokens. Like here, we start with like, 11 tokens, but not all tokens are important. It's very safe to prune the sentence as a visual treat, the film is almost perfect into as treat film perfect in the first layer. Okay, so compress it to five tokens. Initially it's 11 tokens. In the next layer, we'll continue pruning it to two tokens, like film perfect. And still we can classify the sentiment. The task is to the sentiment classification. It's still positive, right? So therefore, um, we can do such cascade uh, token pruning. Why it's called cascade? Because we prune a little bit and then a little bit gradually we prune very aggressively. So how do we determine which token is going to group prune away? Let's see this example. I bet the video game is a lot more fun than the film, similarly here. 
and we calculate the attention map. It's n by n attention map, right? And here we are going to see the cumulative attention score, cumulative attention score for each token. If the attention score is small, like the is, we are going to prune those tokens away. For those important tokens, those heavy tokens like video game, it's pretty heavy, 1.2, 1.7, we're going to keep it. So look at the attention map, prune it if the attention score is small across the whole column. So that's how we prune it. Uh, basically that became cascaded token pruning and also cascaded head pruning. We can even prune away the entire head. Like Lama 2 has 16 head, 32 heads, etc. We can uh, prune the entire head. We can also do the local value pruning, right? If the QK transpose is small, we don't have to fetch the V. If the QK transpose is small, no need to fetch the V since it's not going to be useful anyway. So just look at the first BMM, calculate the QK transpose, and then see if it is big, thresholded, and don't, don't fetch the V, don't fetch the value if the key times area is small. Finally, we can also do progressive quantization. Let's apply low precision first and see if you are confident. If it's not confident, how do we tell that? We look at the soft max. If it is very, very soft, then it means there's no one that is very significant. That means we are not confident. Then what do we do? We fetch those high precision. Otherwise, we are having a very, hot, very sharp um, uh, soft max distribution. Then we can tell we, we don't need to fetch uh, those uh, those MSB uh, those LSB. Okay, so just use uh, this eager mode to do progressive quantization. And this uh, token pruning is actually quite widely used these days. Like three years later, this paper called H two O heavy heater um, tokens uh, proposed a technique to look at the generative autoregressive mode. Also look at the attention map. Okay, this is a four by four attention map. Difference is that now it's autoregressive. So you only have this, uh, this half, bottom half of the attention map. You look at the attention score, cumulative attention score for each column. If this column is small, then we prune it away. Okay, if it is small, then we prune it away. And uh, those important tokens in this paper, they call it a heavy heater, heavy heater. And it's showing that in the in this way, we can prune a lot of the uh, tokens in the in the KV cache. Compared with dynamic sparsity or static strata sparsity or this window local sparsity, uh, this static sparsity of H2O can find those heavy hitters, those important tokens, and prune those unimportant tokens in the KV cache. Um, the sparsity pattern may also be uh, may also be dynamic, which depends on the input. So that's the contextual sparsity. Okay, so rather than using the static sparsity, which can give medium medium high sparsity, okay, which uh, the accuracy degrees very sharply um, uh, as you remove more parameters, but this contextual dynamic sparsity can well maintain the accuracy even if you compress a lot. And here, um, the paper introduced a predictor using the feature map here to predict in the next layer uh, which attention has needs to be pruned, and also which um, channels in the uh, in the FFN layer needs to be pruned. Okay, you can run the predictor in parallel with the calculation of either the attention or the um, MLP layer, and overlap the communication with the uh, predictor, and as a result, can uh, bring uh, by significant speed up. So this is input dependent sparsity. And also there's also the mixture of experts showing that for each input token, I don't activate the full network. Okay, so there are two um, tokens, more parameters, two tokens. Um, one is act activating the second FFM, the other is activating the first FFM. So different tokens can be routed. So here we have a router can be routed to different experts. So that's why we call it a mixture of experts. So here we have four experts. Um, this first token used expert two, second token used expert one. 
the more expert you have, you tend to have uh, better, um, better training loss. And here we define this capacity factor as the number of tokens per batch, like six tokens per batch in this case, divided by the number of experts. Like here we have three experts. Capacity factor, if it is one, then we have on average two tokens. Okay, we have two tokens. Uh, every expert can pro process at most two tokens. Although here, uh, three tokens are routed to device zero, the first expert is only taking two of them. And if this, um, this capacity factor is getting larger, like 1.3, now if each expert can have a slack um, of, of slightly holding more um, requests. So this is cor corresponding to the capacity factor of 1.5. So six tokens can be routed into now three experts sitting on three different devices. And that's how we parallelize that. So this routing becomes very important in mixture of expert. Um, you can route it in several ways. You can either uh, choose the top K for each token across the expert dimension, like each token select your expert, or for each expert select which token you wanna, you wanna serve. Or you can do a global decision to globally decide which expert to assign. All right, that completes the efficient inference algorithm part, including quantization and sparsity. Let's take a break before we jump into the systems. All right, welcome back. A lot to cover. So in the second part, let's cover efficient systems and also efficient fine tuning. And starting with the uh, VLM. Before that, let's recap what is a KV cache. In the context phase, uh, there's no KV cache, but in the generation phase, the KV cache is a very important concept. Like in this case, uh, we are having the uh, text generation task. I love Trinium, and then we are going to generate the next, uh, the next token. Okay, so after we have X2, we are going to multiply um, the query, which is the query, query key value, a query of X2 with the with the key of zero, and also key of one, and also key of key of two. Okay, and we are going to use this um, as the weighted for the weighted sum to multiply with the value to get a weighted sum of the value for different Vs. And then as you can imagine, as we generate more words, this, this KV cache is gonna get pretty longer and longer, growing linearly with the sequence length. In last lecture, we calculated, uh, uh, we learned how to calculate the size of the KV cache, size of the batch size, number of layers, um, number of KV has, we can use MHA, if you remember G, uh, GQA um, and also um, um, to replace this multi head attention to reduce the number of KV, uh, KV has. And also the embedded dimension, uh, the, the length of your sentence, uh, K and V, and so two values, two bytes for IP16. So that's two and a half megabytes per batch size per sequence length of Lama 7D. Okay? And if we have six, Users sequence length is 4K that require 160 uh, gigabytes to a 100 GPUs. So now we wanna solve this problem when you have more users, how do we um, shrink the size of the KV cache and try to squeeze as much um, as possible in, in a single GPU. So let's see, what is the problem when you are serving multiple users, right? Uh, say there are, uh, Two sentences, one is artificial intelligence is the future of technology. The other is like request B, RLM is blah, blah. When we are doing this, we have to pre-allocate the size of the KV cache for different um, requests to prevent this runtime um, allocation, which is pretty slow. We wanna pre-allocate uh, this chunk of memory okay, to serve this task. What's the problem here? you don't know how long your sentence is. So you don't know how large should we, um, should we allocate. And the only way is we have to allocate um, as large, uh, relatively large value to prevent overflow. Right? So that immediately uh, resulted in uh, the external fragmentation. Okay? We are not using that, but we have to re uh, reserve that. So um, 
due to the different sequence lengths, some are long, some are small, different requests, you have external fragmentation. And also internal fragmentation, you have to over allocate due to the unknown sequence output length. Right? Um, these um, 2000 tokens are wasted. And also the reservation um, uh, loss due to when you are generating like future, these are not generated yet. They will be generated in the future. I assume you have to allocate this at this, this time stamp. So wasting here, wasting here, and wasting here. Which reminded us of what? The operating system, right? We are up, um, trying to manage the memory for different processes. Like process one, process two, uh, they have the memory fragmentation. So this is the analogy between memories uh, between the operating system versus the large language model serving. You have two different processes, A and B. Uh, we, we can use a page table okay, to add one level of indirection okay, to prevent such fragmentation. And also we can have other advantages like um, uh, control the um, um, access authority, et cetera. But uh, here we are having the same pattern, like different requests may require generally different length of sentences so we can dynamically allocate them by having a, something similar to a page table here, add one level of indirection and use this KV block. Every time we allocate a block, okay, the maximum waste we have is the size of the block, and then not rather than wasting a lot of memory in the KV cache, especially when we are serving different users whose requests may be of different lengths. So let's see how that works. So um, here we have a logical KV cache block. Okay, so different blocks are consecutive. When you are generating a sentence, it's like word by, uh, token by token laid out in this way. And in each block, just like in each page, each page has four four k four uh, k bytes. And each block here, just as an example, is like four blocks, uh, four tokens in each block. And this is the physical. Uh, KV cache block. Block size is the same, four tokens, and you have eight blocks. And in the block table, just like a page table, to translate between uh, this physical block number into this uh, logical block number. So this is the physical block number versus how many slots are already filled. You can fill as, at most four tokens in each slot. So when we are generating the prompt, Alan Turing is a computer scientist. And, and let's, let's watch this video and see it again. And so far we are occupying two uh, pages, one page, another page. And every time it's going to allocate a new token if the a new page, if the number of slots is filled as full. So this is logical block table and physical memory allocation. Interesting part is when you're getting renowned, it's not consecutive. It may be from a different physical place, but logically they are consecutive. And the translation is done through the, um, uh, the, the block table, mapping the uh, physical block number into the logical block number and counting the number of field slots. If the number of field slots is four, like in this case, four, we have to allocate another page in the physical memory. Like now it's full, then it has to allocate another a block, block number three. So we put three right here. So let's see what happens when we have multiple requests. Okay, this is request A, this is request B. Request A is completing this sentence. Alan Turing is a computer scientist and mathematician. And request B is saying artificial intelligence is the future of something, right? And actually they are sharing this physical um, KV cache blocks. Now we have eight blocks and the green one belong to request B, yellow ones belong to request A. Um, they are interleaved um, so that we, we no longer have to uh, have this uh, worry about this external fragmentation since every time we just allocate a page, 
And the maximum of waste we have is probably three in this case. And the amazing part for large language model is that we can share, okay? we can share um, the prompt when we are doing parallel sampling. Parallel sampling is saying the future given the prompt, okay? uh, they can be shared across different uh, sequences. We pass it through the large language model you can say, future of cloud computing is bright and poised for future growth, is intertwined with advantage of AI, is likely to be characterized by several key trends uh, such ben uh, such um, parallel sampling is especially helpful when you are doing the co-pilot, uh, co like you are writing the code, you give it a prompt, you want it to give you several suggestions, three different suggestions, you pick your favorite one. And in th this case, we can share um, this, uh, this prompt in the KV cache rather than having three separate uh, memory allocations, just one memory allocation, Okay, the future of cloud computing is okay. Um, so two different um, requests they can use the same amount of uh, memory for the the same piece of memory for the um, for the prompt. Okay, so that's v uh, VLM, uh, V for virtual, and let's switch gear to jump into a streaming LM. Right now we handled multiple users in VLM. Okay, and multiple users, multiple requests. What about much longer sentences? You wanna have a continuous chat with a virtual chatbot, like a virtual girlfriend. And how do we prevent it from uh, forgetting your stuff or getting out of memory? So uh, those are the streaming applications um, uh, where you wanna run these multi-round dialogues with very long interactions, right? So conventional method, right, using the transformer um, and also windowed uh, attention, you can see uh, using a naive transformer, the, as the input sequence length gets longer, the memory grows linearly, right? So a natural approach is, uh, although the memory is growing, that doesn't mean it's working well, because if it is exceed your contact, your training context length, the perplexity is going to hike, it's going to break. Okay, so after here, like 4K, where the training window size is 4K, the model quality is getting very bad. What if you use a window, right? Can we just use a window uh, so that we can uh, use a limited amount of memory? So if you use window attention, that's the uh, green part. Uh, although the memory stays constant since we're using a window, see the perplexity suddenly broke when, um, your sentence length exceeds the window length. Why is that? Because when the sentence length exceeds the window length, the first token will be evicted. And in this paper, we find the first couple of tokens are super crucial, called it attention sync. You cannot evict them from the KV cache. Versus this streaming LM, um, the memory is constant and also the perplexity is pretty low, all the way to, this is 10K. Actually, we measured all the way up to four meeting. So this is the video demo without streaming RAM versus with streaming RAM. First model breaks, performance breaks, and then it becomes out of memory. While streaming RAM, the model continues functioning for QA, 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 continuous functioning uh, without being stopped. So there are two uh, critical uh, failures. One is the model performance breaks perplexity breaks, the other is out of memory. So let's see how do we solve those two problems. A natural approach to prevent it from uh, being out of memory is to just using a window for window attention. And right? for every token, you just look at say here, window size of four, you just look at four elements ahead of you rather than looking at everything in front of you. Okay? So in this case, the perplexity is um, T times L, so L is the number of cached tokens, T is the number of total tokens. Okay, so every time um, the, you have to calculate um, L and then you have to calculate T times, why the, that's why the perplexity, the complexity is TL, but the perplexity is huge, perplexity is huge. As long as when um, we exceed the KV 
the, the size of the KV cache size, even when we are exceeding the window, the first token will be evicted and then the model immediately break. Another approach um, is the original approach, the dense attention, everything you calculate, everything ahead of you, the complexity is OT square area of this blue region. But the perplexity is big because you exceeded your training length. At training time, you have never seen such long number of tokens, therefore it failed. And this is window attention it failed. And the only way that works is by recomputing. So getting rid of the KB cache, everything is computed from scratch as if this token is the first token. You recompute the KB cache. So this area um, is actually L square. You have computed T times the complexity in total is T L square. So although the perplexity is low, computation is just so high, it cannot afford. So what the interesting phenomenon we find is actually the first token is just so important. A lot of attention to after layer two, many other layers randomly sampled there have a big attention to the first token. So the initial token have huge attention scores, even if they are not sem semantically significant. And we call it a uh, attention sink. So those are tokens are disproportionately and received such a high attention irrespective of their semantics. And why, uh, and also we actually observed this three years ago when we are publishing the Spaten paper in HPCA, 2021, um, for example, this sentence, he is a very famous researcher in the computer architecture era, area. And the new token papers had, uh, attend very heavily to the first token, he, but he actually doesn't have much semantic meaning. In the second example, when we are having that paper, that at that time, we're still using GPT-2 in late 20, in the fall of 2020, GPT-2 for language modeling. And we are doing a progressive token pruning. Like Du Fu is a great poet of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, recently a variety style that have been used in efforts, blah, blah. And actually it tend to prune Fu was a great poet, etc. right? Why prune Fu, not Du? That doesn't make sense. And actually because Du is the first uh, sync token, that's the attention sync. So we've observed this phenomenon like three years ago, but not until today we figure out and have a, have a deeper understanding why that's the case. It's actually due to the softmax function. In a softmax, it has to sum up to one, probability has to sum up to one. Even if some of the tokens are not quite important, it doesn't necessarily have to attend to each other, but the attention score must sum up to one for all the contextual tokens. So the initial token is special, um, it has the advantage being the sync due to uh, it's the first one. And all the subsequent tokens will attend to the first token due to the auto regressive manner. Um, therefore, uh, the word being predicted all attend to the first token. And so since the softmax has to sum up to one, if something is not quite related, they just decided, the neural network just decided to dump all the attention scores to the first token. And that's the attention sync hypothesis. And we try to see whether it's the position that matters or the semantics that matters. So we try to replace the sync token with this slash n, which is a line break, doesn't have any meaning. But we find actually it performs the function almost as well as using the uh, four uh, original token as the attention sync much better than doesn't have any attention sync, which is showing that the um, position matters. The first four tokens, the position matters, not the semantic, even replacing with line break still works. Very interesting phenomenon. Therefore, our solution is just to add back the first column as always, just always keep the attention sync, okay? and then do window the attention later. So we are generating token seven, um, assume the size of your uh, KV cache is eight. Now everything is a KV cache. When you are generating token eight, 
we keep the attention sinks for in this case, skip four, and then using a rolling window manner for the remaining tokens. And don't forget to change the positional encoding. Um, for this is the attention sync, evicted token, rolling KV cache. We want to have the um, relative position in the KV cache rather than the original uh, uh, absolute po uh, location position. So the positional encoding would be 0, 1, 2, 3. And then here is 4, it's not 6. So that's the only thing we need to change. And the integration with streaming LM with the page, the attention, the BLM is very simple. Just to pin the first page in the KV cache. Never evict the first page of the KV cache. Certainly, it will introduce a little bit of overhead since you actually just need to pin like four tokens, but a page maybe 16 tokens, but it's very easy to implement. Let's pin the first page in the page attention and then change the positional encoding and then you have the VLM integrated with streaming LM. Actually, they already did the in integration in the past two weeks, which is super exciting. So now we can uh, compare the dense attention with window attention, with sliding window with, uh, attention with recomputation versus streaming LM. Uh, previously, the window attention breaks when the month is greater than the KV cache size since the first sync token is evicted. And for the dense attention, the performance breaks once the length is longer than your pre-trained uh, window size versus uh, this recomputation, uh, sliding window with recomputation versus streaming LM, they can both well maintain the perplexity. They pretty much overlap, so you cannot tell the difference having very low perplexity. But why not recomputation? There's a huge amount of computing overhead. So, and also we tested all the way up to 4 million tokens. That's very long, it didn't stop, stop working. So um, the model for different models, Lama 2, 7B, 13B, 70B, different models work consistently well, all the way to like 4 million tokens and didn't stop. So now we compare with the only working baseline, which is sliding window width recomputation. Just get rid of the KV cache, recompute KV each time. Actually, we can make it um, reduce the latency from 1,400 to only 65 more than 20x speed up compared with that baseline. Um, saving the memory and also works quite well for different models. So how many attention sinks is needed? Previously we mentioned four, but why is that the case? Uh, we tried different um, configurations, like without the, KV, uh, without the attention sink, keep zero tokens in the front, the model, the perplexity exploded. One attention sink, 11, two attention sink, 10, four attention sink, nine, and the eight attention sink doesn't quite help. So it begins to plateau between four and eight. So we decided to use four tokens as the number of the attention sinks. But this still seems to be an arbitrary number. Why four attention sinks? If we have the um, luxury to train the model ourselves, can we train a large language model that only one, need one single attention sink with one dedicated attention sink. Okay. So we train the models from scratch in, by introducing an extra learnable token at the start of all the training samples okay, to act as a dedicated attention sink. And this is the uh, comparing the vanilla versus plus the sync token. Um, the pre-training loss is actually, actually a little bit better in this case, although this is a pretty small model, we have to verify that on a larger model and call for collaboration here. Um, to verify adding this attention sync actually can also reduce the training loss for larger models. Um, this is showing the uh, cache config with only one attention sync. If we have the luxury to train the model from scratch using a learnable, dedicated learnable sync, only one token can match the performance with a pre-trained model that requires four tokens. So this is just population study showing that four is, as it looks like, to, uh, looks like a random number. Actually, we can use uh, pre-training to have only one dedicated sync token. But even if in that case, the sync token is in crucial because without the sync token, 
the perplexity will explode. Later, people also verified this idea on the Mistral model. Remember, Mistral model is trained with windowed attention. So at times time, still attention sync phenomena is required. All right, next, let's jump into flash attention. Okay. Um, remember, the, uh, the attention mechanism is pretty big. It's all in square memory. If you have to uh, materialize um, the attention map, everything in memory. But um, the memory is fast, then it becomes, uh, becomes small. It's slow, then it becomes large. So what if we, um, rather than materializing everything in the memory, how do we, can we do it on the fly? Okay? Rather than materializing a large n by n attention matrix, so we try to uh, do it on the fly, compute block on SRAM, and um, the green part is in the DRAM, and as a result, it can uh, use this fused kernel uh, for QKT softmax uh, transpose and V. QKT transpose uh, normalization uh, softmax times V, everything merged into a single uh, kernel to avoid such large memory materialization and reduce the memory footprint. And as a result, it can be uh, much faster. This is showing the speed uh, without causal mask and also with causal mask. One is the GPT style, one is the BERT style. Actually, uh, the acceleration uh, with these two versions of flash attention is quite significant compared with naive PyTorch. The next cool technique is actually speculative decoding. So the decoding phase generates output tokens one by one, one token after another. Every token requires like seven billion parameter like 14 gigabytes if it's without quantization, if it's Lama 207B, right? Can we, um, uh, can we use two models? Okay, one is a small model, one is a big model. This is not distillation, uh, by the way. One small model 7B, large model 175B. Uh, we can run the small model autoregressively, generate one token at a time. And when it generate K tokens, okay, we feed the K tokens all at once for the bigger model. So the bigger model is having a batch size of K. It's no longer doing one token. So it's, uh, the arithmetic intensity is actually larger. So it's no longer memory bounded in this case. Since for a large GPU, um, processing to K tokens, time if K is not too big, is almost the same as processing one token due to the large parallelism. So the large model is gonna decide uh, for each token I'm gonna verify if that's a good prediction or not. If not, I'm going to reject it and start from over there. Like in this case, the small model is going to generate different tokens autoregressively, one after another. And after that, we feed these four tokens at the same time in a single batch manner, a batch manner for the large model, and verify each one um, if it is a good prediction or not. So the large model Verify it in a batch in a bad batch manner. If it is not good, then we are going to correct it. So the green part is generated by the small model, Japan's benchmark bond. And the large model uh, verifies these several tokens all together in a batch manner and find bond is not a good prediction. It's going to re replace it with another token. And then the small model is going to generate several tokens one by one again and feed it to the large model. The large model rejected the last one, replaced it with five, and similarly on and so on. So in this manner, um, if we are lucky, many of the tokens are actually in green generated by the small model without using 175 billion parameters, but only seven billion parameters. But still we have the luxury of having a larger model to verify the correctness. Um, but it's doing that in a batch manner to improve um, the arithmetic intensity. Since processing K batch is roughly the same time as processing a single batch if the K is not too large and parallelism of GPU is large. All right, last section, lots of cool techniques, efficient fine tuning techniques. We always have to want to uh, customize our, our large language model, but how do we customize a model that has like hundreds of millions of parameters. One way is to use low rank. So 
So this is the pre-true in the weight. Okay? They can be in the projection layer, in the um, FFN layer. And we, we only learn the bypass branch, not this branch, we freeze it, it's in blue. We only learn this bypass branch. Initially, initialize with uh, identity. This is a, a random noise. This is initialized with the zero. So uh, inference time is adding uh, no effect, but we can learn um, this bypass branch by using the low dimension here, the number of weights here could be uh, much smaller. So instead of learning the full weights, we learn the bypass branch, a small low rank component. And actually can re re receive pretty good accuracy at much lower number of training parameters. And by the way, this is in log, so actually a huge phenomenon saving. This is low, low rank uh, adaptation for large language models. There's also the QLORA. We can also have the quantized version. Uh, so this is the original full fine tuning. You have to store a lot of optimizer state, which is the same size of the model. Um, but using LoRa, uh, you're only learning those bypass, low rank bypass branch. Okay, so the optimizer state becomes much smaller since the amount of parameters needs to be updated is much smaller. But still, the base model is at P16. So QLORA combined the idea of four bit quantization with LoRa. Um, basically, you can use a four bit transformer so that the inference time you can use a smaller model. And at uh, um, update time, you can use the uh, P16 to, to update the low rank model. And in particular, they propose an NF4 format, which is similar to a, a K means classroom. They, they find a, the optimal sign choice given a normal distribution, which is a defined a new data type, but they need to use the lookup table uh, to decode. And also double quantization, applying the quantization, not only to the weight, but also to the scaling factor, first to the weight and then to the scaling factor. And also paged optimizers with a CPU offloading. So if the optimizer state, some of them you can offload it to the CPU. And the next idea is using the adapter. Okay, so Dora basically add another bypass branch on the, in parallel with the main branch. So this is in series with the main branch. Okay, that's the adapter, which is inserted into the main branch after a tension feed forward and inserted an adapter layer and similar here. So by, um, by using those techniques, we actually have to tune the model, right? You either have to tune the bypass branch or, or your feed forward branch is, uh, is quantized as QLORA, or you tune those adapter layers, okay? So in any case, uh, different tasks require different model. Can we use the same model by only tuning the prompt we gave to the model? Okay, so that's the prompt tuning, very widely used in industry these days. Previously, the prompt is discrete, like here, uh, please summarize the following text as a prompt. We actually can train the prompt, the BP back propagate all the way to the prompt for different tasks. You have different, you have the same large language model, but by using different prompts, we can make it to do different tasks. You just prepend um, the prompt into each task. And the good thing about it is that the prompt is different, but the model is the same. Therefore, you can use batch the inference to handle different tasks. Previously, for different tasks, you have to different, use different set of weights. Now you are using the same set of weights, but just use different prompts. So therefore, we can use um, the same um, model, just different model may have different prompts, and use the batch inference to handle uh, multiple batch, rather than having different models to handle different case. Now we have the same model to have a, to handle different to do handle different tasks, like the ABC three different tasks. We append it to the to the beginning of our original prompt, and we feed the concatenated prompt, which combines uh, the task prompt versus our original prompt, and the task prompt can be trained, okay? so that we can take advantage of the same pre-trained model rather than having a separate pre-trained models. And here is showing that model tuning and prompt tuning, this is number of parameters, 
and this is the um, um, super glue score, actually um, the prompt tuning can almost uh, make it as good as the um, tuning the model, okay? When the model is getting bigger, when the model, model is getting bigger. Uh, compared with like prompt design, manually design the prompt, just prompt tuning by using this learning-based approach rather than this rule-based approach, the learning-based approach can almost match the accuracy of fine-tuning the model. And to just give you some exposure, what we learned today, how it applies to industry and what is a real world application. So very timely, media released this Tensor RT uh, LLM last Thursday, which is state of the art serving infrastructure from NVIDIA. And these are the techniques used in the TRT LLM uh, in the official release and all the green parts we have covered in the lecture. In today's lecture, in, in last Thursday's lecture, including multi-head attention, multi-query attention to save the KV has group query attention, uh, in-flight batching, page the KV cache, basically the VLLM, um, and also the um, uh, quantization for smooth quant, uh, GPTQ AWQ FP8, covering early lecture, uh, rotary position encoding. And in the training section, we are going to talk about the tensor parallelism and also the pipeline parallelism. And, um, everything is open source uh, in this library. Feel free to uh, check it out and run uh, these models. So that's, that's all for today's lecture, covering the efficient model compression algorithms using quantization pruning, a large language model, both weight pruning and also activation pruning, um, efficient systems, including VLM, streaming LM, flash attention, speculative decoding, and also the uh, fine tuning techniques to update your model using uh, either changing the weight using LoRa, QLoRa adapter, or fixing the weight by changing the tuning the prompts. All right, that's all for today's lecture. We'll see you on Thursday.